All right, excellent. All right, well, good morning. Uh, my name is Steve Marr. I'm with Risk Management Professionals, and welcome to our webinar. Today is October 27th, and we're going to be talking about tips for addressing OSHA's new PSM interpretations. Uh, but before we get started, just a little bit of background information. Just a little bit of background information um, about risk management professionals. We are an engineering consultancy. Um, we uh, deal with, help people pull, pull together a lot of their PSM and risk management programs. Uh, we help a lot of people in California with CalARP and in other states with their accidental or disease prevention programs. We do a lot of process hazard analysis and a lot of the different elements of these PSM and RMP programs. And so what we do is we use these webinars as opportunities to share our expertise and background and tips on best practices. Uh, it's not all that altruistic. We also use it to uh, train our own people internally so that we're all marching to the same tune and applying best practices. But first, before we get started on our, on our webinar, I'd like to do two things. First, let me talk about our interface and, and what you're looking at. You'll be looking at a full screen image of a PowerPoint presentation with a, a smaller image, a smaller video image of the speaker. Uh, you can go ahead and resize those images. You can also shift the speaker image to either the top, right, or bottom, even though it defaults is coming out on the left hand side. And if you have any troubles, uh, use the chat interface on your, um, on your GoToWebinar inter, um, uh, command window to send a message to the producer, and the producer will get back to you. That's also our interface, our, the interface most people use for questions uh, during our question answer period at the end of the webinar. Uh, you can also, if you'd like, uh, have yourself unmuted if you'd like to actually join into the discussion. But during the webinar, most people are muted just to make sure that your normal activities, being on the phone, shuffling papers and whatnot, don't interrupt everybody else's opportunity to, to uh, participate in the webinar and hear what's going on. So anyhow, without further ado, let me identify our speakers. Uh, speaking today will be David Childs and Morgan McVeigh. Uh, David uh, was a, gra as a mechanical engineering graduate uh, of the University of California in Santa Barbara. Uh, Morgan is a uh, graduate, chemical engineering graduate of the University of California in San Diego. And they'll be, I'll David will be speaking first, and they'll be focusing on tips for addressing OSHA's new PSM interpretations. David? All right, thanks, Steve. So as Steve mentioned, uh, we're going to be going through a few new interpretations to OSHA's PSM program. Uh, the first one that we'll be going over is the retail exemption interpretation uh, associated with whether or not you would qualify or your facility would qualify for exemption based on a uh, retail classification. The second one we'll be doing is a 1% uh, threshold interpretation which applies to the highly hazardous chemicals list that OSHA holds. Uh, I'll go over a quick definition of what an interconnected process is and how that applies to the PSM program. And uh, then we'll go through some examples of how to calculate whether or not your process would be covered uh, based on how many, how uh, the quantity of chemicals that you have, along with a, an, in a, <clears throat> an example of an interconnected process. Okay, so the first uh, interpretation has to do with the retail exemption rule. So in the past, uh, what OSHA had said was that you would qualify for retail exemption based on what percentage of your sales came uh, directly from sales to the end user, and that threshold was 50%. So if you had 50% or more of your sales directly to the end user, you would qualify for that retail exemption and wouldn't have to put together a PSM program. Uh, this didn't really capture the nature of what OSHA was going for with this uh, exemption, so they made some revisions to it. So it's no longer based on what percentage of your sales is coming uh, directly from uh, sales to the end user. It's now based on what sector your business falls under. So if you're part of NAICS sector 44 or 45, you would classify for this retail exemption. So that would be places like gas stations or something of that sort. So they have large quantities of highly hazardous chemicals on hand, but they're giving them out to the end user in very small quantities, you know, 20, 30 gallons maximum at a time. Uh, some people who are taking advantage of this uh, exemption fell under the wholesale business category, which is sector 42. They will no longer qualify for this exemption 
So those would be uh, farm supply merchants and things of that sort that would be selling thousands of gallons of uh, nitrogen at a time for fertilization purposes. Uh, so they would no longer be covered or exempt. So what does that mean if you're no longer going to be exempt from the PSM? It means you're going to have to start developing that program. But you're not going to be starting from scratch, most likely. Almost all of these companies already have an RMP program, too, in place. And this program already in, uh, implements eight of the 13 PSM elements. Uh, one thing I want to point out, however, is that the PSM regulations are slightly more stringent when it comes to those eight elements that are already in place. So you will need to make sure that they are up to uh, the PSM standards. And uh, this, this was issued out uh, earlier in uh, 2015, in July. And OSHA is giving uh, one year from the time that that was released into in, uh, to when they will start to enforce this. During this year, until July 2016, they will be focusing on making sure that businesses are compliant and helping companies get on track. Uh, there is exceptions to that, however. If they feel that your facility is posing an immediate and severe danger to employees, then they will cite you. But the goal here is to make sure that everybody is compliant. OK, the second uh, interpretation that we're going to go over today is the 1% interpretation uh, for highly hazardous chemicals that OSHA covers. Um, in the past, they called it a commercial grade rule. So 126 of the 137 chemicals that they have listed as highly hazardous, uh, they make no reference to what the threshold concentration is that you would need to be covered by. Um, instead, what OSHA said in the past was that your system would be covered if, you held, if the chemicals in that process were at commercial grade. Now, the issue with this was that OSHA had put out multiple definitions of what commercial grade was. So at one point, they said that it was based on if you had pure chemicals in your system. So if you had anything less than 100%, you didn't qualify for a commercial grade. They also made references to uh, you could look at a published catalog, and whatever that says is the commercial grade, that would be uh, what you would need to be covered by. But this left a little bit of discrepancy. Different catalogs might publish different thresholds. So they needed to streamline it all into the new 1% interpretation. This was also in an attempt to uh, align their regulations with the way the EPA looked at chemicals. So they've already inter uh, started using the 1% interpretation with the EPA. So now OSHA is using it as well. And now all processes will be assessed when a chemical is held at a concentration at or above 1%. Um, so there's a couple exceptions to that, however. If the partial pressure of the chemical in the vapor space is less than 10 millimeters of mercury, you uh, would not have to follow this. Uh, also, on the list that I mentioned before, 11 of the chemicals have a, uh, a listed threshold concentration, and that would supersede the 1% rule. Now, this doesn't mean that OSHA is looking at the full solution weight. What they're still concerned with is the weight of highly hazardous chemicals within that solution. So in order to calculate that, you could take the full weight of your solution and then multiply it by the concentration of the highly hazardous chemical within it. And that would give you the number that you would need to compare to OSHA's threshold quantity. OK. One last thing I wanted to go over before I hand it off to Morgan is the definition of an interconnected process as it applies to the PSM program. Uh, OSHA defines the process or a process uh, here that you can see on the screen. Um, a little abridged version of that is that any group of interconnected vessels or separate vessels that are uh, in the close vicinity to that process would be considered part of an interconnected process. And uh, there's been a little bit of discrepancy about this in the past. You know, if you have a tank that's occasionally hooked up to your system, but not always, would you need to consider that part of the process? Could you say, oh, this isn't part of our process because it's not always part of that um, full system? But what OSHA wants to point out is that if it's kept in the vicinity and is nearby, then it needs to be considered part of it at all times. And now I'm going to hand it off to Morgan for some examples. Uh, yeah. Thank you, David. 
So I'll be going over some examples really quick. The first one is the process comprises of 1,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds of a 1% hydrofluoric acid solution by weight. Is this process covered by PSM? So the first step is to go to Appendix A of OSHA's PSM standard and look up hydrofluoric acid. As you can see on the screen, there is no concentration associated with this chemical. Therefore, the 1% rule applies. So if 1% or higher of hydrofluoric acid is in the process, then it may be OSHA PSM regulated depending if the threshold quantity is met. So to find the amount of the hydrofluoric acid in solution, you take the amount of pounds times the concentration and you get 1,000 pounds of hydrofluoric acid in this example. And this does meet the threshold quantity stated in the PSM standard. So this is a covered process. So the next example is a process comprises of 10,000 pounds of 50% diacetyl peroxide solution. Is this process covered by PSM? So once again, we go to Appendix A of OSHA's PSM standard and look up diacetyl peroxide. For this example, there is a concentration stated that it must be greater than 70%. So in this example, it was 50% diacetyl peroxide. So no, only concentrations of diacetyl peroxide that are greater than 70% are covered by PSM. The 1% rule does not apply to chemicals with explicitly stated concentrations in, in Appendix A. An employer shows that his process containing 11,000 pounds of a 3% highly hazardous chemical solution has an HHC partial pressure of 7 millimeters mercury. The threshold quantity of the HHC is 100 pounds. Is this covered by PSM? So looking at OSHA's PSM standard, it states that if the partial pressure of a highly hazardous chemical is less than 10 millimeters mercury, then the process is not OSHA covered, even if the threshold quantity is exceeded. So for this example, a portion of an interconnected process contains a mixture with less than 1% of the covered HHC. Does this mean that this portion of the process is not covered under PSM? So in the OSHA regulations, it states that an interconnected process is a single process for purposes of coverage under PSM. So the answer to this question is no. A process is either covered or not based on whether the weight of one or more highly hazardous chemicals in any portion of the process that meets or exceeds the threshold quantity in Appendix A. When determining the threshold quantity, only the HHC present in a mixture at a concentration greater than or equal to 1% by weight should be counted. The portion below the threshold does not contribute to the total weight of the chemical in the process. So for this example, there are two processes. Process 1, which is in blue, and process 2, which is in green. Process 1, displayed below, contains an HHC above the threshold and therefore is PSM covered. Process 2 contains the same HHC but is below the threshold. The two processes do not share piping. Is process 2 covered by PSM? So as you can see from the picture, there is no interconnecting piping or, and both chemical processes are completely separate. And so, but OSHA's PSM standard states that multiple separate vessels located such that both could potentially be involved at one time in an accidental release are considered to be a single process. Therefore, process 2 is PSM covered. This is the same example, however, now there is a large distance between the two processes. So now a release in one process would not cause a release in the second process. Therefore, the two processes are completely separate. So process two is not PSM regulated. So for our final example, we have four 55-gallon drums of a 48% by weight aqueous hydrofluoric acid solution stored in a warehouse on a single pallet. Does a threshold quantity of hydrogen fluoride exist? So the first thing to acknowledge is that the storage of four drums on a single pallet is considered a single process, as a release in one drum may cause a release in all four drums due to their close proximity. Therefore, to see if the threshold quantity is met, you must calculate the total hydrofluoric acid in all four drums. So you've got 55 gallons in one drum, which is 250 pounds of, hydrogen, of hydrofluoric acid per drum times four, you get 113.5 pounds. So going to OSHA's PSM standard appendix A, look up hydrofluoric acid, and you can see that the threshold quantity is 1,000 pounds. So because there is more 
pounds of the hydrofluoric acid in the process, it exceeds the threshold quantity and it is indeed PSM regulated. So stay tuned. Um, coming up next is the interpretation of OGA's, uh, OSHA's recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices. On November 10th, we'll have the case studies in process safety. November 17th, urban water management plan updates webinar. And December 3rd, we'll have application of HAZOP LOPA during design phase. And finally, we'll be co-hosting the regional seminar this Thursday in Bakersfield. So contact us if you have any questions. Now I'll have David come up and answer questions with me. It looks like everybody really enjoyed your presentation. <laughs> I found it very informative. And I'm not seeing any questions coming up on the chat window. So I think we're in good shape. All right. Sounds good. Perfect. Well, thank you for watching. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Good day.